My name is Father Meyer. For those of you who do not know me, uh, I am the pastor here at All Saints Parish, and I'm also the lead teacher for our RCIA classes. RCIA is the acronym for the Rite of Initiation, the Rite of Christian Initiation of Adults. Sorry, the Rite of Christian Initiation for Adults. That's ridiculous. I couldn't think of that. Um, and uh, I am very, very thankful for you being here. Thankful for you. Uh, for those of you who are entertaining the idea of being Catholic, for those of you who are committed to the idea of entering the church, and for those of you uh, who are sponsors or friends uh, or spouses, also very thankful to our individuals who uh, are part of our RCIA team and help uh, put on our presentations each week. So I'd like to begin just by bowing our heads and asking the Lord to be with us this evening. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this night. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the ability to know you, to love you, and to serve you. We thank you for the calling that you have placed within our hearts. And we pray tonight for the grace to be faithful to that calling and the ability to all the more uh, grow in a deeper love of you through these classes, through these opportunities, and through this formation experience. We pray that all that we do may always draw us into a deeper love of you, and thus, because of that, a deeper love of our neighbor. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died on Mount Calvary, rose from the grave, and who now lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we back, uh, we're going to... We're going to be begin as we always have with reading out of the, the Bible. We're going to read the gospel passage that you will hear this upcoming Sunday at Mass. We're going to change it a little bit different this year in the fact that... Good evening. We have, we have like discussion questions that we're going to have you do then in a group instead of me just leading normally in, in years past. So... Real quick, so this is a Bible. This is called a Missalette. This is what you see in church. If you've gone to a Catholic Mass, you see these often. They're, uh, and we call them Missalettes. So a Missal is actually not like, you know, like we're going to blow things up. Like at, at the, in the sanctuary where the priest is celebrating Mass, there's the big red book that the server holds. That is called the Missal. A Missal et is a small Missal. These are uh, disposable and they last for normally around four months. Three to four months. Within them are, is everything that's said at Mass except for the homily uh, or the sermon. So I, I'm, I'm required to make that part up. Uh, but I, I always say, like, if you can read, you could really be a priest. Like, that's all that it takes is everything that needs to take place at Mass is actually in the Missal, or you can find in the Missalette. So, um, know that the readings are always in there. We're going to actually have a class where we'll have a whole stack of these, and we'll literally give you a crash course. Because sometimes it's very hard, if you've ever tried to use one of these things, to, like, make your way through it. And you're like... I feel like I've wasted my whole time like paging through this book and I don't even know, I, I was like lost the whole time, like why did I even bother? So uh, we'll, we'll help you with through, the, uh, through that. But um, this is always a great way to know like what the upcoming readings are and uh, what's going to be happening. So uh, we're in tonight in Mark 9, 30 through 37. So I realize it's, so we'll, we'll do introductions of all of you later, uh, but one of the great things about RCIA classes is that we often have a whole spectrum. We have people that are unbaptized. We have people that have been baptized in another Christian denomination. We have people that have been baptized Catholic, but maybe we're never raised in the faith. So normally we have people like all over the place. And so what's great about it is that we try to cater to all of that and meet people where they're all at. Which means for those, of, for those of you who maybe were taught or raised in a very, very strong Christian home 
or taught or raised in a strong biblical-based home. Like some of this is going to be review, some of it will be uh, will be new, uh, but all of it I guarantee you uh, will help you in your faith. So next week the whole entire class is on the Bible, okay? But uh, I'm going to give you the uh, Father Meyer uh, minute thirty second tour of the Bible. So welcome to the Bible. We believe that this is not man's word, but this is God's word. So like. When we read this, we don't read this as you would read any other type of literature. You can study it as literature, and in fact, in the Bible, you find poetry, historical narratives. You find different, within that as well, you also then find where we, would, we, 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 we can find all the beautiful things of analogies and allegories and all the great things that you learned about in English class, if you liked English class, are in here. The only thing that's not in here is fiction. It's all real. And we believe that it's not just words on a page. We actually believe that it's, we believe that it's God's living words. When we read it, we actually believe that God is actually speaking to us while we read it. Now, a Buddhist could read it, a Hindu could read it, or an atheist could read it. It's still God's word. And in fact, many Buddhists, Hindus, and atheists who have read it actually convert if they're open and receptive to it being God's word and to God working in their lives. So, if you look at your Bible, uh, about three quarters of it is the Jewish Old Testament. We are Christians. Our foundation and our root is Judaism. We don't reject our Jewish ancestry. We actually believe and are convinced that Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism. So us understanding our Jewish ancestry and our, our Jewish roots is really, 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 really important. And in fact, you'll, you'll see again and again and again in many of our classes, that particularly Roman Catholicism is, and will, and will boldly proclaim to be, a full, authentic living out of the fulfillment of, of Judaism in Christ. When we talk, particularly when we talk about the liturgical worship, when we talk about uh, the way that we live out our faith, uh, it really is, in a ritual sense, a fulfillment of biblical Judaism. So anyways, three, three quarters of the Bible is, for the most part, the Jewish Old Testament. We'll talk about that later. Uh, and then, of course, we then head into uh, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you've never heard of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will. And then we, we head into the epistles, which are another word for, for letters. The letters that were written by St. Paul, by St. Peter, by St. James. Um, and then we also have the historical book of the Acts of the Apostles. So, I will uh, always give you verses. So, for those of you who know how to do this, you're fantastic. So, we're in Mark chapter 9. You'll also see in the top of the page, in the center, that there's a number. We're on page 82 in the New Testament, which means towards the back of the book, not towards the front of the book, because there's a front page, 82, as well. We're in Mark chapter 9, verse 30 through 37. So when we talk about 30 through 37, you'll see chapter 9, and then you'll see that each, each few sentences has a number attached to it. So we're actually on page 83, where it says the second prediction of the Passion, and then you see the 30. Here we go. I'll read it, the, 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 the passage first. They left there and began a journey through Galilee, but he, meaning Jesus, did not wish anyone to know about it. He was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is to be handed over to men, and they will kill him. And three days after his death, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to question him. They came to Capernaum, and once inside the house, he began to ask them, What are you arguing about on the way? But he remained silent. They, did not dis they had been discussing among themselves 
on the way who is the greatest. Then he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone wishes to be first, he shall be the last of all and the servant of all. Taking a child, he placed it in their midst, and putting his arms around it, he said to them, Whoever receives one child such as this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but the one who sent me. At Mass we have responses, and when we're done reading the Gospel passage, we say, the, the, the priest of the deacon says, the Gospel of the Lord, and then the response is, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. It's supposed to be kind of, the, I always like to think of myself as, I would actually love to be like in a black parish somewhere where like, if I had to say the Gospel of the Lord, people are like, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Like, amen, brother. <laughs> I, I would love to preach, totally love to preach in a parish where like people like shouted amen and gave me hallelujahs. Like, I would preach for hours. I know some of you are like, Father, you already seem to preach for hours. <laughs> I would short my homilies to allow time for people to give me amen and hallelujahs. But we, in, in our church, we refer to those as acclamations. We're acclaiming what is true. So when the priest of the deacon says, this is the gospel of the Lord, the gospel of the Lord, the congregation then says, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And we say that because the gospel is the sacred scriptures that most intimately speak about the message of Jesus Christ. When we read a reading from the Old Testament to the New Testament, at the end of it we say the word of the Lord and we say thanks be to God. So we're thankful for that reading because it is God's living word. When we proclaim the gospel, we say the gospel of the Lord, we, we literally praise Jesus. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, for that word, which is God's saving word. So we'll practice that real quick. Ready? The gospel of the Lord. Praise, praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. That was perfect. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. You should have a blue piece of paper. You really only need one per group. Uh, and we are going to have... Carol and Tom, you're going to turn back to this table right here, and you three are going to turn back to that table right there, and you all can turn back that way, and Ashley, you can turn back this way. I want you to go through the questions on the sheet, and if you actually first go around and introduce yourselves to each other, because you, you might not all know each other, uh, but then we're going to begin each class kind of with this format as an opportunity to read God's living word, share God's living word. Um, with each other, and out of that, we'll, you'll, you'll see that the, the questions are, are guided uh, to kind of hopefully bring about some catechesis out of Scripture as well, and hopefully also have it personally give you some strength and some nourishment uh, as God's Word does. So, everybody turn around and let's do it. Do some introductions first, please. Kind of get our first class under our belt. Um, from all of you, if I had to say, just this is kind of like brainstorming or I say a word, word association. If I say Roman Catholic Church, what are characteristics or what are thoughts or ideas or images that come to your mind? I say Roman Catholic Church, you say, anyone can speak here. Pope. The Pope. Crucifix, Mass. Crucifix, Mass. Statues. Saints. Saints. Truth. Truth. Eucharist. The Eucharist. What'd you say? Confession. Confession. Rational. Rational. Apostolic. Handed down from the apostles. Handed down from the apostles. Original. Bride of Christ. The Bride of Christ. Here's my homilies. <laughs> okay, this is a video. I, I you, few things you know about me, like just overall as a teacher. I like short videos that make a point. I love images. I was actually just talking to one of my brother priests on the phone. Not on the phone. I went and visited him uh, on Tuesday night. He was talking about his RCA class. 
and he has he actually has in his class the art teacher from the high school who is con who like is eagerly converted to Catholicism. And I said to him, I said, do you ever use like a PowerPoint in your class? I said like I show images all the time in my class and I love using art history as a way to like teach the faith because it really is unbelievable. Like the 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 tradition of the church when it comes to art and music uh, is really, 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 really profound. But anyways, this is a great little video. This video is was made actually as a Super Bowl commercial to be aired during the Super Bowl to welcome people back to the church. I think it's phenomenally done because I think a lot of the things that you just mentioned you're going to see in this video and even more. So we'll watch the video and it'll trigger a lot of things and, and we'll kind of redo the, 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 ex, the exercise that we just did. So here we go. That exercise again, and I asked the question, what are some characteristics or what are some aspects of the Catholic faith that you value or that come to mind when you think about uh, the Catholic Church, what would some of those ideas or thoughts be? That you would, you would add to our list that we already started, which was such a great list. International. International. I love these videos, and when I work with young people, which I do a lot, I always love to show them videos of people that are Catholic, that are of another ethnicity or language or skin color, to just remind them that they exist. Because it is so easy for us, particularly in the culture where we live, to think that this is the world. And as you know, this is not the world. It's the farthest thing from it. It's one of the reasons why I also love bringing young people from parishes, particularly in this demographic, to international events. So I'm going to World Youth Day in January. There'll be millions of young Catholics there. And, and for them to just to, to, to witness and experience that international culture of the church. Uh, a lot of people will say one of the great things about being Catholic is no matter where you go to Mass, if you travel internationally, you can go to Mass and you know exactly what's going on even though it's another language. You go to Mexico, you can go to Mass and you know exactly what's going on. It's the same structure, same format. In fact, if you have a missalette, it's the exact same words as well. Like the readings are the same no matter where you go every single Sunday. Um, what else? Family. Family. The emphasis on family, so on so many aspects. The respect of life from unborn to, to natural death. The defense of marriage, the, the upholding of marriage, the dignity of marriage, but also the promotion and culture of family, all deeply rooted. Compassion. Compassion. So this is this is huge. And like it's the big boast that so in two thousand and two when there was the, the, the sex scandal that rocked the church in two thousand and two, there was a Jewish uh, lawyer who, who in defense of the Catholic Church uh, when things got pretty ugly, he was the one who started this litany, which has now kind of become normative in the church, that the Catholic Church clothes more people, food, feeds more people, and cares for more sick people than any other organization in the whole entire world, and always has. That it educates more children and has made a huger impact in the world than any other organization. And we don't, I, I don't say that to boast or to, but like, it's just, it's the fruit of the church is that there's a huge emphasis on the corporal works of mercy. Burying the dead, caring for the sick, clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, giving shelter. So that is a huge part of it. A huge part of the hospital system in the United States of America is our Catholic hospitals. A huge part of our school systems in the United States are Catholic schools. And they exist for a purpose and for a reason. What else? Education. Education, so from elementary school to college, college education, the university system was ultimately founded by, uh, by the Catholic system, the Catholic desire for thought, um, and that truth, all truth, even truth of the, the natural sciences will lead ultimately, we'll, we'll get to the whole, we'll, we'll have a whole class on the arguments of the existence of God and people are often think that we should be afraid of science or afraid of of truth and knowledge and it's it's it's, it's absolutely the the opposite true study of science will always lead you actually back to god not the inverse that if i start studying science i'm going to walk away from god if you're doing that then you're missing some part and in fact the like the the, the most 
common one is the Big Bang Theory. It was actually invented by a Roman Catholic priest. So a lot of our history's greatest scientists and mathematicians were actually Catholic priests. Not that they had to be a Catholic priest, could be any Catholic, but just in the sense that like they weren't heretics, they weren't bad men, they were men who used grace and wisdom and the Bible to lead to an understanding of the natural sciences. Yeah. Anybody else? Universal? Universal. So tied to that nature of culture and ethnicity, but yeah, the fact that it is, it is a universal faith, there is a united faith. Uh, people in China right now are studying the same catechism, the same teachings that, that we're doing tonight. Uh, and there's something powerful about that. Okay, there should be a handout, I believe, in your folder tonight. It should say 20 reasons. Is that in there? Yes. Bob, is there an extra folder back there? Elizabeth needs one. And actually, can I have one as well? Sorry. You knew I wanted the black one. I knew. I, I knew. <laughs> Silly me. Lynn is so good. Okay. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna just quickly go through this list once again. Tonight's just kind of an overview. Uh, we'll then go through the schedule and kind of I want to. There, there's a rhyme and a reason to kind of things that we're going through. But I just want to go through this tonight. My prayer and my hope is at the end of this class, you would be able to at least say two intelligible sentences or more about all 20 of these. So here's here's a goal that I'm setting out for myself. Uh, we'll see if, uh, if if on the end if that's really the case. And it might not. It might you might read some of these right now and be like, I know exactly what that means. Uh, but hopefully maybe I'll, that would be framed in a new context. So these are 20 reasons why you should be Catholic. <coughs> Number one, the, the church is one holy Catholic apostolic and it was instituted by Christ himself. So we'll talk about what does that mean. Those are referred to as the four marks of the church. One holy Catholic and apostolic and it was founded by Christ himself. So we have no other founder. So we, are, we weren't founded by Lutheran or Calvin or... Uh, by Joel Osteen, who I actually really like Joel Osteen, by the way. Uh, he's some great... If I could preach like Joel Osteen, it would be another world. But anyways, number two. Catholics hold the Bible to be the Word of God and were responsible for compiling its texts. In the fourth century, the Catholic Church under the divine guidance of the Holy Spirit compiled a number of writings, books, gospels, and letters of the apostles to make up what is now known as today as the Bible. Only the Catholic Church possesses the original text. Several reform groups have reformed books and texts from the original Bible to ensure that single verses of the Word of God in the Bible is never misinterpreted. Catholics consider the whole the Holy Bible as a whole. So we'll talk about that, how to read the Bible well, but to, to read the Bible within the context of the Bible, to not take verses out of their context, which then uh, can lead down to some some errors in what we would understand of, as truth. Number three, the Catholic Church rejoices in the communion it shares with brothers and sisters here on earth. So the fact that we're all together, the fact that we're united to all Christians throughout the world, and the union they share with those who have gone before us, the faithful departed. So those would be the saints in heaven. It would also be the people in purgatory. So when we talk about the church, we speak about the church that's in heaven, the church that's in purgatory, and the church that's on earth. If that doesn't make sense to you right now, that's totally fine. We'll get there. Number four, Catholic worship. The Holy Mass, which is sometimes referred to as divine worship or the order of worship, has remained unchanged for thousands of years. So the way that we celebrate the Mass, what takes place at Mass, really is an ancient custom. It's not something that we make up and decide to do. Uh, it is passed on to us. We'll read a document from the early 100s that actually gives the order of worship or the order of service, and it's the exact same that we have today. Catholic worship is universal no matter where you go in the world. The Holy Mass, baptism, marriages, ordinations, etc. All are administered the same way. This, is, this ensures stability and continuity. So it is one of those things, when you go on vacation, we always like to say that you don't go on vacation from God. When I was a little kid, 
Uh, my mom and dad, when we would go and visit grandma and grandpa, we would always go to mass. And as a kid, I actually, it was actually, it was a joy. Because we were going to like grandma and grandpa's church and they would sing different songs, but it was always the same. It was always different, but it was always the same. I remember one time we went to Disney World and we went to mass at the Polynesian Resort. Uh, because they would have Sunday mass, at, they had like some sort of arena there. I don't know, uh, that's my memory of it, but it was kind of like a gathering place. And we would go to mass at the Polynesian Resort. And then we would go to Epcot Center, because that's what you did. Um, number seven, the faithful are guided by the catechism of the Catholic Church that consists that contains its beliefs and teachings, rooted in sacred scripture, therefore ensuring uniformity in belief and teachings throughout the world. So we'll talk about what the catechism, you, you may have never heard the word catechism before, but the catechism of the Catholic Church is a book that through 2,000 years of living and studying sacred scripture, the Catholic Church has taken the sacred scripture and has put it into theological statements that proclaim what we believe. Um, number eight, the Catholic Church enjoys the ongoing presence of Jesus Christ in its churches. The Eucharist is truly the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. He is here. So we thoroughly believe that at Mass, bread and wine become the flesh and blood of Jesus, and that is a, a a very great treasure of our church. Only the Catholic Church enjoys the universal leader, the Pope, who is a descendant of St. Peter, who is appointed by Christ himself. Those are, those are biblical passages there, Matthew 16. The word Pope is derived from Papa or Father. So in a world where people will say, well, how do you know that's true? Or who has the authority to say that? Who has the final authority? Who has the final word? We have a place to look to, which would be um, the Pope, the Cardinals, and the Magisterium that would protect the truth, we would say. Number 10, the Catholic Church possesses the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So in Matthew 16, Jesus give, gives keys to Peter, and this symbolically is, is the passing out of authority and power and tradition. The Catholic Church enjoys a valid priesthood, each priest having been adorned, ordained by apostolic succession, the original apostles. So it is true that every bishop that has ever been ordained in our church could actually, who laid hands on them and laid hands on them and laid hands on them, which is how you get ordained is by a bishop laying hands on your head, uh, can be traced back to the, all of the original apostles, which then uh, gives us at least confidence and assurity that the, that the truth and the same Truth is being passed on. Uh, and then the same is true for priests. The Catholic Church appoints its priests and parishes out of obedience and faithfulness. Priests are not elected by a board of directors or a church council. So I'm not here in Guilford or Yorkville or Dover or New Alsace or St. Land because I want to be here. I now do want to be here, but I was brought here because my bishop said, you're going and you have 10 days to pack your bags and to get out of Jennings County and to get to Dearborn County. And uh, which is different than some congregations where they either uh, vote on or hire or choose a pastor. Uh, Catholics suffer through their pastors. Uh, and uh, this is the truth of it all. But um, so priests live their lives by a life of obedience uh, under the governance of a bishop. The Catholic Church has bishops that teach, govern, and sanctify. Catholic bishops are shepherds to a diocese that usually embraces a large territory in which is located a number of parishes, priests, and ministries, hospitals, universities, food pantries, homeless shelters, etc. So the Archbishop of Indianapolis, we are part of the <coughs> region of the territory known as the Archdiocese of Indianapolis, which is in Indianapolis from like 86th Street in Indianapolis, all the way across the state and south. And then Evansville is its own territory, its own region. So within our diocese, our bishop is in charge of 150 parishes. There's about 110 priests. There are 11 Catholic high schools. There is one Catholic university. There are a plethora of Catholic hospitals. And he has governance over all of them. And then within each of those parishes, then your parish boundaries, in our parish boundaries, we actually do not have, we don't have any Catholic hospitals or universities, or if we do, let me know. Um, but I have, I have priest friends 
that like in their parish boundaries, they have like multiple, like one of my good priests has a prison, a hospital, uh, a university, um, and two parishes that are within his responsibility. And so he is responsible for all of them. So he says masses at the prison, at the hospital, at his parishes, at the university. I live the good life. <laughs> okay, the Catholic Church is administered of seven sacraments. We'll talk about all seven of these. Baptism, Confirmation, Eucharist, Confession, Anointing of the Sick, Holy Matrimony, and Holy Orders. The Catholic Church is, it enjoys the sacrament of baptism that gives new life to the soul and admits it into the body of Christ. This gift, the best of gifts, is given to infants. So we'll talk about infant baptism and why infant baptism is such a treasure and a gift within the church. The Catholic Church enjoys the sacrament of confession, the means instituted by Jesus to obtain the forgiveness of sins after baptism. Confession is often looked at as the worst thing in the world, and confession is one of the happiest and greatest things in the world. It really, really is. If we understand it in its proper context, it is like it is such a good, good thing. The Catholic Church enjoys the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist that gives life to those who receive it on a regular basis. It is His very body and blood. The doctrines of the Catholic Church are unchangeable. Church teachings are not based on subjective beliefs of individual ministers or a board of directors. Um, that's why we're often not liked by society in the world. Sacred tradition has an important place in the Catholic Church during the first 400 years of the church history. When there was no Bible, <clears throat> the entirety of Jesus' revelations was passed on to successive generations by apostolic su su succession, which is sacred tradition. So in the Catholic Church, we hold the sacred scripture, we hold, we hold the Bible to be God's very living word, but we also believe that tradition is very important for the passing out of truth. And then number 20, the Catholic Church protects the sacrament of marriage. Uh, and we'll talk quite a bit about this during classes, but uh, and right now in a world very, very much so that is questioning marriage and is no longer believing in marriage, we are a, a church that very much so, to the point of, of being ridiculed and to the point of being misunderstood, uh, we very much so uh, believe in marriage and teach marriage, proclaim marriage and defend marriage. Um, yeah, and it can be very hard. Um, I'm not going to ask you have questions about that because I hope that you do have questions about things on that sheet and that's the whole goal of why you're here. My hope is that we're here to answer questions, we're here to, um, yeah, to help you search and to come to a deeper comprehension, a deeper understanding of what God has put into your heart, which is a longing for him and a love for him. And that's why we're here. That's what this is really all gonna be about. I wanna go through the schedule. Um, so this is the schedule. It's pretty simple. The dates are on the left. The topics are in the center. Uh, all of it is subject to change. Even there might be times where it says that there's class, but there won't be class. I'll give you an example. Our parish goes to the movies. We love going to the movies. It's fun to go to the movies. And oftentimes we're able to get preview screenings of movies. We, go to, we just see Christian movies. And sometimes those happen on Thursday nights. So normally every year, at least one time, there's a movie that comes out and we're like, we want to go. And so we cancel class and we go to the movies. You aren't required to go to that if you don't want to go. We will communicate thoroughly to you that we're going to the movies that night. You're more than welcome to go. Um, so the, sometimes the schedule will be adjusted. Uh, we will have information to you about snow. If we have a, a, a winter weather policy, if the public schools are closed during the day. We do not have class, period. So even if it's, just, even if it's like a bad snowstorm and it clears up by 12 o'clock noon and it's sunshiny and everything's fine, if school was canceled in the morning, there's n we, we shut down everything for the whole day. It's just the easiest way for us to communicate that things are closed. If 
school's in session and the weather gets really bad at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock, we'll call you and let you know. There aren't that many of you and we can take care of that. But just so you know, that's kind of how things work in that sense. Um, there will be the, you kind of see the topics that are on there. There will be certain times that I will not be here. One of them is actually next week I will not be here. But you should still be here. Um, and our wonderful team takes care of teaching. They do an excellent job. We actually get high compliments on them. Some people like them more than me. So uh, they will take very, very good care of you on the weeks that I can't be here. But like, there are some obligations that I have. So like next week I have a cross country meet. Um, and, but it's very rare that I am not here. Are the yellow ones the, the classes that I'm not, now that I'm looking at? Is that what that is? Okay, so the yellow ones are what I'm not in. I guess you all know. So like, we know your schedule now. play hooky on those days because I'm not here. But um, anyway, so then things, I, you see all the time. I'm not going to read the topics to you. You can read. Um, but then coming down towards the very end is April, uh, April 21st is Easter. April 20th is the Saturday night before Easter, which is known as the Easter Vigil, which is the night before Easter. And once the sun is set, we begin what is known as the Easter Vigil, which is like a three-hour mass with biblical readings and things of these sorts. And that is where individuals who desire to receive baptism or confirmation or Holy Communion or entrance into the church, that's where that takes place. And so you see information there. Uh, there's a practice in the morning, and then the vigil is in the evening. And our year kind of culminates down to there. So you can put those into your calendar. I would like to say with you to class, uh, you should bring this with you every week at class. If you know that you're a person who can't remember things, you could leave this here. You are not required to take it with you. Um, and if that's best for you, that's great. When we get into like kind of meteor topics, not like meteor, but meteor topics, there will be, um, there's never homework, but there will be, um, there, there, there might be things you want to take home to like, to reread or to review or articles sometimes that I will pass out that uh, you might want to take home and read. So that's completely and totally your call um, and up to you. Um, questions about any of that? Questions about the schedule? Does all look okay? Okay. Then, um, there is this, uh, this write-in here by Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, which I always like to include during our first class. So let's talk about who Fulton J. Sheen is. Uh, for those of you who are old, you all know who Fulton J. Sheen is because Fulton J. Sheen was on regular television prime time on Friday evenings and was broadcasted all across America. And this is when there were only four stations. And the vast majority of Americans, whether you were a Catholic or Protestant, would watch Fulton J. Sheen on Friday nights. That's like what you did. If you go to YouTube, you can watch him, but he's a phenomenal orator and speaker and presenter, and he would speak on very strong Christian topics. Uh, he would also speak on Catholic topics, but because his, his audience was much broader than just Roman Catholics, he would speak often more generally on virtue or on topics of those sorts, um, and then he would save his more specifically Catholic topics for... Uh, the missions and the retreats that he would give. But um, he is one of my favorite speakers and also writers. He has a lot of really good books out. Um, he is deceased and his cause is up for him to be, to be named a saint in the Catholic Church. But he has this writing, and I'm going to actually show it to you in a video form, about if he was looking for the Catholic Church in the world, if he was looking for the church that Christ founded, what would he look for? And I think it's a, it's a pretty powerful analogy. So we will uh, 
will go here. Again and again, we'll see this analogy that Christ and the church are one. Uh, of course, to make very clear and bold that the church is a hospital of sinners. The church is uh, full of sinners. So when we talk about the church being divine, we have to remember what, what the entirety of the church is. The church is the church that we see visibly present on earth, but it's also the saints that are in heaven are in eternal communion with God, and the church is the body of Christ. So when we speak of it, we have to speak of it in its, in its total understanding, not the fact that there are priests and bishops and lay faithful and ourselves who uh, are not saints and not divine, uh, but we desire to be intimately united to Christ who is um, but I think this is it's a great analogy, and I think that when we look at the church, particularly uh, as she is often portrayed in society and the world, she is uh, often misunderstood because she's treated the same way that our Lord was, which was completely misunderstood by the times, by the era, and uh, and that's an okay. That's okay. That's that's what we should expect, and for us to to believe that the world and society is going to love the church or love uh, fervently Christians we're, 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 we're hardly mistaken uh, and it's okay for us to accept that um, any questions I promise you that I would always have you out here yes Jackie not, not a question nope. but I really like how Archbishop Sheen says how much we love and I'd like to state we as Catholics love all people regardless of their denomination yeah. or their atheism and we don't hold ourselves superior but we love them yep and I, i'm actually glad you said that jackie because i want to also just make a like a from the very get-go and i will say things throughout the whole entire i wouldn't be who i am today if it wasn't for my protestant brothers and sisters who in college like very very much so had a huge impact in my life and like never in class do I ever, if I ever come across that I'm like talking down or one of my very, 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 very dear friends, and she's a tremendous witness and example for me today. And she was on, at my ordination day and I visited her and her husband at her house and they just gave birth to the first child. Um, uh, is she claims like totally no religion, like she is an absolute fervent Christian. She loves Jesus, but she's like non-denominational to like another whole other realm of like non-denominational. Like she rejects all form of like anything but just reading your Bible and loving Jesus. But like she's one of my greatest inspirations. Um, and I love her tremendously. So I'm glad that you said that because it is true. I mean, and that's where I think Pope Francis has, I think, been a tremendous witness and inspiration about the love and compassion that, that all Christians are supposed to have uh, because that's what Christ did. Whether it was a Samaritan, whether it was a Jew, uh, whether it was a person that was possessed with a demon, Christ loved them beyond all belief and we're called to do the same. And uh, this gives us the ability to do so in a, in a great way. So you, get, you are more than welcome to stick around, enjoy some fraternity, time with friends or new friends uh, or get reacquainted with people's names. We're going to ask a, a blessing upon us this evening before we leave. Gracious Lord, we thank you for tonight. We ask that as we commence and begin uh, this new RCIA process that you fill our hearts eagerly to know, to love, and to serve you. Help us to have questions answered. And help us to have hearts uh, that are more and more filled with peace. And we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a good evening. I will see you in two weeks. We will be back here 6.30 next week.